This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Do you play FanDuel and feel like you aren't creating consistent money-making lineups? Go over to the DFS Doctors on Twitter at the DFS Doctors and DM them with promo code Detroit Sports to get a free trial for their analytically formulated 70% lifetime profit rate NFL and NBA lineups. The whole purpose of playing daily fantasy sports is to get out there and compete and give yourself a chance to win. So go over to the DFS doctors. Let them help you. They have analysts on staff that look at the best optimal lineup that you can put out there to win money. So why not take advantage? At the DFS doctors, promo code Detroit Sports. CBD is a game changer sweeping the nation. This hemp extract is the natural way to elevate your mood, eliminate aches and pains, reduce anxiety, and keep you sleeping all night long. It can even cut your workout recovery time in half. Get in the game today with 20% off all orders of CBD and lavender products from Lavender Lane, a lavender farm located right here in Milan, Michigan. Just go to LavenderLaneMI.com today and enter coupon code DETROIT for 20% off your entire order. Guys, look, these amazing products are infused with calming lavender to maximize their effectiveness, meaning your CBD items only take minutes to take effect, which is way quicker than those pills you were about to swallow. On top of it, they are perfect for men and women. Lavender Lane has lab-tested CBD creams, tinctures, and roll-ons that are perfect for any situation, even if you're on the go. Put your health back in your hands by heading over to LavenderLaneMI.com and entering coupon code DETROIT for 20% off your entire order of CBD and lavender products. What do you have to lose? Your satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. So if you need lavender gifts for your loved ones or just looking for the natural way to ease your discomfort with CBD, go to LavenderLaneMI.com and use coupon code DETROIT to unlock these miraculous benefits of CBD and lavender. That's L-A-V-E-N-D-E-R-L-A-N-E-M-I.com. And remember, use coupon code D-E-T-R-O-I-T for 20% off your CBD and lavender products from Michigan's own Lavender Lane. Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. This is episode 115. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Strozinski. On today's show, we've got WWE wrestlers signing new contracts. We've got guys not signing new contracts, teasing he's going someplace else. We've got NBC ordering an 11-episode deal for a a future Hall of Famer. I can't even get the words out. Uh, also, we've got a lot of sad news in the news and notes section. Uh, we will take a look at AEW. Well, we will take a look at NXT as well as Raw and SmackDown. And when I say we, I mean he comes along with me everywhere. He is my rider. He's my homie. He's the one. He's the only. He is the Doc, John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Looking forward to this podcast so much to get to. We got a new Impact World Champion and so many things have happened online in, in the world of professional wrestling. Bro, you can't even take a day off of uh, checking out what's going on via social media. The way that uh, Tessa Blanchard was called out was very fascinating. I know we'll talk about that a little bit. NXT, AEW, new deals taking place. 2020, I would say, fairly, has gotten off to a great start. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a little bit of a boombastic start is what I'll say. Uh, let's start with Tessa Blanchard. Uh, so this past was this past weekend. Uh, they wrestled Impact wrestled down in Dallas. Uh, she ended up beating um, Sammy Callahan. Thank you very much. Beating Sammy, Sammy Callahan for the Impact World Championship. So first off, before we get to to, to the entire mess that unfolded over the weekend uh, with her and, and getting called out by other wrestlers, how do you feel about inter, intergender matches? I I do not I do not like them. I don't think it puts anybody in a good spot for a win win. I think it has an opportunity to put someone over like a Tessa Blanchard, but for me, not for titles. I mean, <laughs> the Impact Heavyweight World Champion is Tessa Blanchard. Is she the best wrestler in that company? You could argue she's the most over, but I think there's other wrestlers that are better than her in the ring. And, uh, you know, I understand why they did it. They obviously get their name out there. She's somebody that is a massive force. But on the heels of the weekend that she had in terms of being called out for being a bully, you know, the next day, basically, a racist, being someone that's 
not uh, so friendly to the ladies backstage. And you realize, whoa, she got called out. And actually, she started it because she tweeted out on her Twitter page. She says that, hey, women, try to be nice to each other in my ticket places. And that set off the firestorm. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's not just, uh, you know, people calling you out. Most of the time, most people tend to keep stuff private. But when you go out publicly and say, hey, women, treat me good, they're like, oh, no, 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 Tessa, you don't get to play the victim. Mm-hmm. And the bombs that were dropped, she hasn't been on Twitter since. So the next night she wins the Impact Heavyweight Championship. It was a good match, but at the end of the day, I just don't think it does, you know, for me, not something that I'm gravitating toward because it's hard because you get that, you know, notion back in the day where Andy Kaufman would wrestle women like a farce. So you still got to kind of move forward from that. Charlotte is probably the next best candidate to maybe be realistically in the ring with men and and maybe have some intrigue. But do I want to see Charlotte be the universal heavyweight champion of WWE? Absolutely not. not. So it has this niche, you know, maybe to get someone over that's maybe wants to test themselves. But week in, week out, you know, for me, I don't watch Impact all that much anyways, but it got my attention. We're talking about it. But I just think that now you're pigeonholed because you got to keep her the world champ for quite a while. Who's she going to fight now? RVD? What, you know, who, who's she going to take on? It's just, I don't think that that's something that I want to continuously see week in, week out. Yeah, I just, to me, it doesn't do either competitor any bit of good. So Sammy Callahan takes a loss to a woman. Oh, okay. Like, it just, it that doesn't, I... That doesn't do anything for his character, Why? right? Why? She ends up beating a man. Great. Like, okay, cool. So now you're a badass. But again, like you said, where does she go from here? Is she the best wrestler in that company? I don't know. You know? I I, I don't necessarily think so. It, it, to me, just intergender matches don't make a whole lot of sense, especially intergender matches for, for championship titles. And then, like you said, we have all of this fallout where she basically gets taken to task by... The entire female wrestling community. It wasn't just one or two. It was multiple people who have been either in locker rooms with her or have wrestled in organizations next to her, really calling her out and really taking shots at her because it seems like she has done nothing, absolutely nothing but take shots at other people her entire career. Now, WWE had a chance to sign her and WWE passed on her because of attitude issues. It's one of those things where I tend to believe all of these other female wrestlers calling her out instead of her side of the story just because it's a whole lot. Like, like yeah, the way the scales are balanced here, it's a whole lot to a little. And WWE passed, like, you said to me, we were texting, you said that would be a bad bitch in WWE. Like, she would be absolutely awesome. But WWE wants nothing to do with her. You can't be a locker room cancer because you're on the road all year long traveling to Europe. They will pass. WWE is not like that. They'll pass on people that are troublesome. No doubt about it. And so if you want to advance your career, doing stuff like that will get you nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. Did you get a chance to hear what Triple H did and kind of the fallout from that in terms of going online, kind of having a a jovial joking moment about uh, at the expense of Paige? I seen parts of it. It it, it just kind of refreshed me. Bring me up to speed a little bit because I've seen little bits and pieces of it as I was kind of scrolling through. He's promoting NXT TakeOver. It's probably a morning meeting, one of many that he's having. And he's kind of in a room, I guess, full of reporters that are probably kind of just kind of tired or looking a little bit like they're not paying attention. So he's kind of just talking about how Edge potentially could come back, Daniel Bryan. Uh, He's talking about and addressing how, you know, the WWE takes the health of their athletes very seriously. And he's joking around about Daniel Bryan and his health and how hard he worked edge. And then he turns and he talks about Paige and he goes, you know, well, Paige, she might have kids that she doesn't know about. And it it was a joking moment. And then the room started laughing and he's like, oh, good. You guys are paying attention. I thought I I was going to have to get you guys all a cup of coffee and they move on. But unfortunately, Paige responded and she said, look, you guys keep making fun of me. Now I know why when my boss makes fun of me. The basically there's two sides to it. Those that say, look, it's a joke. She can't have kids. It's kind of one of those things that the boys kind of rib each other with in terms of having kids and not knowing about it. And he applied it to Paige. And I just looked at it like for me, it was kind of like ribbing Paige for kind of some stuff in the past and her, uh, you know, away from the ring type stuff. But when people say, hey, this is the CEO or the vice president of a major company, you can't be doing stuff like that. And she took offense to it. He reached out. He apologized via his Twitter. And it's going to blow over because it's Triple H. And that's where a lot of the fans go. I don't really get offended by the guy that was doing the chop, the, the you know, the, the, the crotch, crotch chops. chops. Yeah. So 
for me, I wasn't offended by it, but you got to realize, Triple H, you can't make jokes like that at yeah. that position, especially in this day and age. In the offended culture, a lot of people are upset. Nikki Bella comes in. The Bella Twins are like, this has to stop. Uh, see, this this um, treatment of women will never change as long as men keep kind of having these jokes. It's prevalent. And unfortunately, you just can't do it in a public setting. And that's kind of the battle that women have is that, you know, locker room talk and guys being stupid. But this was a bad moment for Triple H, one in which he'll learn. This guy is, you know— we have to understand people are flawed and we're we're human. We make mistakes. But in terms of the mistake that he made, I'd probably rank it like a, a five. You can't make it. You apologize for it. And people also, too, said that, look, that's technically not, you know, Paige's boss. That's uh, Vince McMahon is the boss. But uh, one of the higher ups can't be joking around in a public forum like that. Yeah. Triple at, H, as watch a, what you say. At, at, in his position within WWE, you technically can't say something like that. Yeah. But – I always like seeing a little bit of the personality, yeah. like, what, like what goes on behind the scenes. And you can see he's got a really good personality. He's funny, willing to make a joke. Uh, it, it sucks that it was at Paige's expense, especially for that. But that was a multi layer joke. Those are hard to tell. Uh, yeah. And he told one. So that's funny. But I would look at it too like you joke. poorly timed and you, you shouldn't be doing that. You joke around with, about the people you love. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And I think from that perspective, you know Triple H has done a lot for her mm-hmm. because look, Paige doesn't have to be employed. She does The thing that she did to the belt, for those that don't know, look it up because we won't talk about it. You know, the NXT belt was defiled in the most disgusting of manners. She's still with the company. You know, he could come out and say, look, you know, uh, when that happened, we can't have her. You know, how can I ever put an NXT belt on someone when people have that visual? But time heals all wounds. You know, so that's why I think that he gets a pass. And as long as he doesn't do it again, if you think he's anti-woman, his, his wife is Stephanie McMahon, the head of a lot of things in WWE, mm-hmm. a big wig. So, you know, she's probably yelling at him saying, hey, you can't talk like that. He'll take his medicine and he'll learn from it. But, you know, women have been evolving in that company. And I don't think there's a culture problem at all, especially with the revolution, the increased emphasis on women. I don't see that being a problem at all. Definitely with Tessa Blanchard, though, culture in the locker room has to always be addressed. And in regards to the Diva show, I always think that there's something going on in regards to whose position's where, who said who to what, and what's, uh, oh, don't look at me that way. And you've seen some of the backstage stuff, but Tessa, she's got to turn it around quick, especially if she's going to be the head of someone's company, being the, the world heavyweight champion. You can't have that prima donna attitude that you're better than everybody else because people will, will, mm-hmm. will knock you down quick. And you can't go around spitting in people's faces and, yeah. and calling them the N word. The N word, like it, you just you you can't do that. Like Whoa. this is that was it, yeah a little higher up. Come on, what are, what are you doing? All right, let's turn our attention to SmackDown. I think both you and I kind of felt the same way regarding kind of how WWE has handled the return of John Morrison. Obviously, he's going to align himself with the Miz, and we're seeing the evolving feud now between the Miz, John Morrison, and the New Day. Interesting stuff, but. I think both you and I said that, you know, the return of Morrison could have been handled on a grander scale, especially with the Royal Rumble being around the corner. Uh, Just having him return on an episode of Ms. TV probably wasn't the most creative way to return a guy that has been away for almost a decade. Yeah, this could have been done a lot different. Yeah, absolutely. What would you have done? So you could have had the Miz feuding with Kofi, could have had him feuding with Big E, could have had him feuding wherever. And... Imagine the pop that Morrison's music hits and, and the crowd just erupts and he runs down to the ring to make a save. Something along those lines would, I think, be a, a much better way to reintroduce him to the WWE crowd instead of having this lackluster Miz TV spot where he did get some good one-liners off. It just kind of felt like it was flat. It didn't really feel like it did a whole lot. I'd much rather see a guy come down to the ring and get in some action instead of just kind of sit around with his buddy and just talk about it. You know what I'm saying? I just felt like this was, this was again, WWE either not having clearly thought through a couple ideas or trying to rush something that you probably could have built upon a little bit more. You mm-hmm. know? Exactly. And so do you like the reunification of Morrison and Miz kind of rehashing the past of their relationship? Or, or should maybe Morrison have done something new? Maybe just kicked off a feud with Shinsuke, something new, fresh, in terms of bringing him back. We've seen it before. Mm-hmm. It's not fresh. It's not fresh, but I don't mind it because I think what this does is now you pair two guys. You had really nothing for Morrison. It's pretty obvious at this point. And Miz has been floundering for almost a year trying to to kind of figure out where he's going to go next. So now I think you put these two guys together. 
You put them in the tag division. And I think you're going to get some really good creative spots out of both of these guys because they're so talented. And I think you help build up your tag team division. What was awesome was I forgotten how unique his entrance was, seeing mm-hmm. kind of him do that uh, flex. And it was nice to see at least via the gifs and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I think they can do more on SmackDown with Morrison and The Miz. One of the things that I think has impressed both you and I has been uh, Lacey Evans and uh, her feud with Bailey and Sasha Banks. I think it's something now that kind of has started to become more uh, predominant on SmackDown. And it's something that's interesting. And one in which I think in this one, you got to kind of put over Lacey Evans. Uh, Bailey, Sasha Banks, they're established. Mm-hmm. Lacey Evans can't be viewed seriously if she's going to lose this one. I think she's got to go over because of the fact that she's right there in that mid-card status, right about to take that next step from where she's at to potentially to be in the mix with Bailey, Sasha Banks, Asuka, and the likes of, of uh, you know Charlotte. I like where this is going. More specifically this week, her promo, the conviction that she delivered it with, I thought was fantastic. And we talk always about being a five-tool player in, in wrestling, right? Having the look, having the the moves, uh, being able to deliver your promo. These are all important things. And I think you're starting to see a character finally get fully fleshed out. I think she's comfortable in this role. I think when she was a heel, it, it didn't feel it didn't feel natural. It felt forced. And it, it didn't really work. Uh, her being the face and, and her being in this situation where They've kind of brought this full circle where they've introduced her child. Uh, now it's it, it seems almost like it's a blood feud between Bailey and Sasha. And, and Lacey wants to do nothing but right wrongs that have been done to her. And I think her character evolution has been absolutely outstanding to this point. I think this is one of the absolute best things going on SmackDown right now. Um, I think there's only one thing that kind of kind of challenges it. And it's what we've got going on with the Usos and Roman Reigns along with uh, the King's Court, which includes Baron Corbin, Dolph Ziggler, and a returning Robert Roode. So what did you think about his return? I thought it was awesome. Surprising. I thought, uh, you know, him being away for potentially uh, using some stuff that he wasn't supposed to use. <laughs> uh, month suspension. Okay, fine. You serve it. You come back. You learn from your mistake. I think it adds heat to uh, the rivalry. Before, you know, kind of we dive into that a little bit, I think the worst moment of SmackDown during the week was the Alexa Bliss-Mandy Rose match. I just thought, like, ah. Uh, Okay, it was decent, but there wasn't much to the match. It uh, didn't evolve too much. So I just feel like with the women on SmackDown, again, we see a situation in which they're not utilized all that properly. Uh, Braun Strowman Nakamura was interesting. It was overall a good show on SmackDown, Mm -hmm. I think highlighted by the main event. I think that feud is now taking the turns in which you want. You want to see back and forth action. And the Usos, uh, I think the Usos took on King Corbin and Dolph Ziggler. Mm -hmm. And then you have a returning uh, Bobby Roode to help uh, those guys, the heels, get over. The the, the spine buster through the announce table Ooh. was fantastic. It, like, exclamation point, right? This is what I'm talking about when you introduce John Morrison, right? You brought Bobby Roode back, or Robert Roode, as he wants to be called now. You bring Robert Roode back, and he delivers in such an emphatic way where you're like, okay, cool, now we've got to talk about this. Whereas with John Morrison, I thought it was cool the way he was kind of a little bit introduced the other day or, or last week on SmackDown. Uh, but I really I really felt this week it could have been much, much better. And I just feel like they dropped the ball. You know, so you look at what happened with Robert Roode and you're like, yeah, give that to John Morrison or or let Morrison do something like that. Like there's other ways you can create and introduce a guy. And, and I thought they nailed it with Robert Roode. Two good weeks of SmackDown. I thought it was interesting the manner in which this feud's gonna uh, take shape. People are reveling in the fact that hey, WWE is doing okay with the factions right now. The singles competition may be on SmackDown could be enhanced. Shinsuke kind of is devalued. I think the IC belt hasn't been kind of defended in the way in which you go. Oh wow, I want to see that match. You, you get my drift? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's one of those things where I just I don't know if WWE knows how to package him or present him. There have been times where he's had this like start and stop. And then it just kind of feels like it trails off or it never really gets going, never gets out of the starting blocks. And I just think it's creative. I don't think creative knows what to do with him. And then pairing him with uh, Sami Zayn, that's fantastic. Cool. He's got a mouthpiece now. But let's be honest. Sami Zayn is is good at being a mid-card wrestler in WWE. You know, he could go probably anywhere else and ascend much higher. But in WWE, they look at him a certain way and they keep him in a box. And now you pair him with... Sam or with uh with, with Shinsuke Nakamura and it ju- it just doesn't it it doesn't seem to fit in it the character again Nakamura's character falls flat it's 
it, it's just been, I don't know. If I was Nakamura, I would totally look at going back to either uh, New Japan or go to AEW when uh, my contract expires. Or a rebranding. You got to just kind of mix it up a little bit because I mean, that character's now almost three, four years old. Yeah. Do you remember when he was uh, in NXT? In NXT, he was fantastic. He was great in NXT. It's one of those, he's one of those guys who gets called up to the main roster and he gets lost Fizzles. in the shuffle. Now, when, when we turn our attention to Raw, I thought it was a great start. When you have AJ Styles and you thought it was going to be just AJ Styles and Randy Orton, all of a sudden you have Drew McIntyre mm-hmm. inserting himself in the mix and he gets the W. I thought it was a great way to open Raw. Good wrestling, solid, and one in which you go, okay, finally, maybe Drew McIntyre, who many believe is a guy that should be in the main event mix, is finally getting his due. A guy that, if you want to say is... You know, maybe an outside the box, you know, thought for winning the Royal Rumble, it'd be Drew McIntyre for me. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think you're going to see a little bit of a face turn here from him, right? I think you're, he's going to kind of leave the heel character away. And I think the face turn is going to do him well. And he's a guy who, when he entered into WWE or when he re entered into WWE, he had done so much good work at Impact and on the indie scene that WWE had to bring him in, even in NXT before he got hurt. He was doing fantastic work. I think this is going to be a prime spot. Now, you, now Drew McIntyre is in the ring with some primetime guys. AJ Styles, going to be a legend. Uh, Randy Orton is a WWE legend. So you, now you're in the ring with these guys, and you're getting the win, and you're making everybody else look good. I think this is fantastic for Drew McIntyre. I thought this was awesome for him. And I think you're going to see more development out of him. Like, Look, he was a guy who both you and I – said he should be a world champion in no time. And WWE highlighted Aleister Black, Buddy Murphy, third match, quality. It was the match of the night. I felt like it was something to behold. Aleister Black goes over, and you realize, wow, these guys can wrestle four, five, six times. They could have a a Sheamus-Cesaro-type rivalry in that ring on Monday Night Raw. It was great to see. I thought the right guy went over. It was another unique match that drew the wrestlers in and drew the fans in. I think that they both love wrestling each other. Mm -hmm. They have great uh, contrasting styles, and I think that people that are receiving it are definitely enjoying it, and they get excited. And then it takes a a twist later on in the evening, which I thought was, was awesome in terms of the fact that, yeah, uh, Buddy Murphy did not, you know, indeed win the feud, but something good happens for Buddy Murphy. So I, I think it's perfect for both. Maybe one in which now Aleister Black can kick off into maybe some U.S. title contention, some maybe some uh, title matches, some upper echelon feuds, maybe even Aleister Black, AJ Styles. Something interesting in that, you know, he's got to kind of get in there now with some upper echelon dudes and see what's up. Yeah, I thought it was nice too because what you did was you had a character who ends up taking an L from Aleister Black. And then a little bit later on in the evening, he finds himself getting paired with arguably the biggest faction in WWE. And I thought it was great character development, right? Like Buddy Murphy can't get past Al- Alistair Black. You know, it's one of those things where he lost and now what does he do? So this seems like a, a desperate man and he ends up joining Seth Rollins. I, I think it's fantastic. I really like it. I thought it was good. I thought it was really good. Now, kind of in the middle of Raw, it's okay. You know, you get to see Charlotte Flair do her thing. You get to see Eric Rowan continue to, you know, take on the the jobbers. It's all good. But now the main event comes along, and I think people were definitely excited to see the street fight. What's going to happen? What does it mean, a fist fight? What are they going to do with this? But at the end of the day, it's basically like a chaos match. It wasn't actually these guys standing in the ring and just, you know, putting up their dukes. It was a chaotic match. They could have called it something different. Kind of felt like a little bit of bait and switch. But these guys destroyed each other. It was one of those things where you go, okay, it's a chaos match, and wow. You know, big show. Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe took on Seth Rollins and the AOP, and it was massively destructive, and it was great to see, I thought, all the way around. Uh, Rollins and AOP get over in this one uh, via the referee decision. It was wild. I think everybody that saw it was just like, what the hell's going on here? But the, the highlight was the fact that Seth Rollins' crew now gains a member, and that member is said Buddy Murphy. Mm-hmm. And now you got a, 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 fear, a fearsome foursome that's going on and taking on a Monday Night Raw. And I think that the idea, you understand now, what WWE is doing is factions. And I think it's a good idea because do you kind of maybe go, it's a counter to the inner circle, maybe saying that uh, Seth Rollins needs to have this crew of people to lead and, and taking this forward. Do you like the idea of WWE going the faction route the early part of the decade? Back to the factions. I mean, I think it's a good idea. You look at what New Japan does, right? New Japan is basically broke up over six different factions, right? 
and everybody's kind of competing for different belts and different titles and, and, and doing different things. I think WWE is kind of kind of doing something similar or trying to. I, I like it. I think it's great. You, you know, you you have this consolidation of power uh, with Seth Rollins and AOP, right? Now you include Buddy Murphy into this. Now they don't have to get much bigger. You know, they can they can stay small. You can have guys doing their own thing as well. But I don't mind seeing this. I think it, I think it's good. Um, you know, you look at AEW. AEW has the inner circle, so like, these things work. In and why not do them? Uh, it's a way to get a lot of guys over at the same exact time. On top of it, you're helping save these guys' bodies. So I think they're fantastic. I think it's a smart idea. Now we move on to Wednesday night, the duel. Uh, AEW last week destroyed NXT, which was kind of surprising in that, well, it's a new year and stuff like that. I get it. But uh, heading into the first couple weeks of the new decade, NXT is trailing just a little bit. And I get it now in that now some of the feuds in AEW are starting to take shape and people are definitely wanting to see John Moxley every week. Cody Rhodes is establishing his feud. MJF and his... Um, his promos are legit, but NXT will start there. What would you think of the DIY reunion? Uh, that was surprising, and I thought that, okay, good. Kind of getting in the mix there uh, to kick off uh, NXT this week. Yeah, I like it. Look, you've got two dudes who have basically ran NXT for years now. Um, one wants the the championship from Adam Cole. Uh, the other one wants vengeance from Finn Balor. Undisputed Era has been running roughshod for a while. I think this is really good storytelling. You've got guys who are going to team up for a common enemy. I like to see this. I think this is good. Plus, they were fantastic. It was one of the most heartbreaking moments when DIY split up. So to put them back together, I think it's fantastic. For those that don't know, why did they indeed split up? Basically, if I remember correctly, I think Ciampa just wanted to kind of go his own way. It was just a heel turn, and he ended up just beating the crap out of Gagarno. Exactly. And and it just was one of those things. Um, It kind of harkened back to... Uh, Shawn Michaels, Marty Jannetty. Yeah. Just a natural involvement of letting these guys kind of do their own thing mm-hmm. at the right time. Exactly. And I think now you bring them back together, I think this is perfect. I mean, they don't have to be a tag team again, but they can they can sure as hell side by side with each other and, and buddy around for sure. So I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. And so in past weeks, you and I have been definitely impressed with Rhea Ripley. Mm-hmm. So now we got a little bit more of a clearer understanding of the direction she's going to go in. Bianca Belair. Mm-hmm. Right fit, right time? I think so. Bianca Blair has done a lot of really good things in NXT. Um, she ends up winning the the Battle Royal to become the number one contender. I, I think this sets up nice. I think her and Rhea Ripley will will actually do quite well together. As far as contrasting and comparing styles, I think they'll pair nicely in the ring. And I think they'll tell a good story. It's going to be interesting to see what happens, though. Because I don't know if Rhea Ripley's ready for a call-up right away. Um, I think you're going to need to stretch this out for a little bit. And on top of that, I really don't want her to lose that belt. I want her to hold that belt for a while. So kind of sad for Bianca Belair because I don't think she wins it uh, as this feud kind of continues along, you know? Um, And and again, I'm putting the cart before the horse here, but I think she's the right choice. I think it's the right time. I just don't think she gets the title at all. And I think it's just because Rhea Ripley needs a long run with this title. So I, I don't know. I thought NXT was pretty solid overall. It was. Good show. Uh, definitely competitive, but I just don't think it lived up to what AEW put on the mm-hmm. table, especially that first hour. Uh, and switching gears to AEW, you start off with the tag team match, and it was a spot fest. Yes, no doubt about it. But the crowd liked it. Baron Corbin was calling it out on Twitter. I don't know if you've seen that. I did. And uh, I definitely understand where he's like, this is not match construction. This is just spot, spot, spot. Crowd loves it. Uh, going from uh, thing to thing to thing. And it's not really wrestling. But I, I understand it. If the fans like it, you give the fans what they want. And I just thought that the start of AEW was interesting. Yeah, no, it started off hot, like super hot. I thought it was a great match. Um, I thought it was fantastic. This this shows kind of the direction that we're going with Adam Page and Kenny Omega too. You can see there's dissension here. You can see that Adam Page doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily know where he fits in. And this is going to come to a head sooner than later. And it might just take place when they take on SCU. You could see Adam Page flip and turn uh, as they kind of battle and, and and turn his back on on Kenny Omega. So this is gonna be this is gonna be fun to kind of see this. I, I'm just concerned about how far do they they kind of draw this out, and and at what point do we really get the 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 main payoff from both these guys kind of going their own separate ways? Were you surprised that 
Santana and Ortiz weren't protected because it's kind of like, you know, this inner circle is supposed to be the it faction yeah. now and, and, and they lose clean in, in this matchup. Yeah, I, I thought it was weird because a lot of the guys in the inner circle took L's, you know, so Santana and Ortiz took an L. Uh, you had uh, uh, Sammy Guevara take an L as well. So I thought it was kind of weird on a night where your biggest faction has big losses. It, it, it's just, it, it, it strikes me as kind of pondering what's the direction here? Where are we going? Is there something else on the horizon? Or was this just one of those things where this is how we're going to book it and you probably won't ever get any payoff? Maybe we're reading too much into it. But for the biggest faction to suffer three big losses in three really highly toted matches kind of made me scratch my head and say, hmm, that's weird, you know? No doubt. And then you get uh, Cody Rhodes and his promos He's are... He's fantastic, dude. When his promo comes on and his music hits and you know it's going to cut one, you got to pay attention. He's one of the best. Maybe arguably top three right now in the entire industry in terms of drawing you in. And he's re- he's replying to MJF. It's going to be a great match. Now, did I hear it correctly? Because I was watching it, but passively, it's going to be a cage match? Yeah. It's gonna yeah, be, I it's heard, gonna I heard be... the word cage. I'm like, oh, baby. Because it harkens back to the, the, the good old days with his dad, Dusty. So I was like, oh... This is something interesting. I'm more, I'm more intrigued. Yeah, I, I think this is he, dude. He's so good right now. Like we, we talked about a couple of weeks, he's basically been carrying this organization on his back. He yeah. has rejuvenated his career, and he looks so damn good. Everything he does is exceptional. He is spot on. He is he is as sharp as a tack every time he grabs a mic. And in the ring, the guy. Honestly, if you had to grade a paper, right, on a scale of 1 to 100, he's usually giving you at least a 90%. You're getting an A performance from him every time he steps in the ring. It, he's been fantastic. You you really can't say enough about him. He's been awesome this entire year. Overall, I thought AW put on a good show. It was entertaining. I thought that uh, overall it's kind of now evolving storylines with Moxley. You want to see a little bit of what's going on with Omega. Uh, it's great. I think that uh, even Pac kind of now has more intrigue all across the the landscape there. And uh, anything that was a drawback for you? I don't, I don't think there was really too much for me that that didn't tell me, wow, this was this was pretty good. I think every match that was there presented, you know, maybe the Brandy segment kind of just didn't hit off for me. I was just like, I'm not really 100% invested. It was mm-hmm. good, but they, they can continue to work on that in terms of the women's division. But uh, two hours, perfect time slot. And you got some news now potentially that AEW is going to expand after one year. I'm, I can't wait to hear about it. But for me, I'll give the point overall for the week in terms of content to AEW. I'm going to agree with you. I thought it was a good show. Um, I thought it. I thought the highs were a little bit higher than everybody else. Yes. I thought it had less lows. Um, I thought it was. I thought it was solid. Solid performance overall. Uh, so you want your news and notes? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What you got? So on Wednesday, All Elite Wrestling and Warner Media extended their television partnership what? through 2023. So we've got at least three more years of AEW on TNT, uh, as well as announcing a new weekly show, and TNT will air AEW on a second night in addition to Wednesday's wrestling program. They're getting their thunder, baby. It's nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. A little, I think maybe a little too much too soon there, but. You think so? Maybe another, maybe not another two hours, maybe another like WCW Saturday night kind of thing on a Saturday. Maybe just a little mix there of like a highlight, a little bit of highlight, one commentary. I don't think you got to put on another live show. I don't think you put on another live show. A recap show. I, yes. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Elias has signed a three-year extension with WWE. The terms have not been released. However, Rusev has mm. not signed a new deal and is teasing leaving. So maybe AEW, ROH, New Japan. It's going to be interesting. He could go anywhere right now, and he'd be super over. Lana signed a five-year deal, so it looks like they might split if he does leave. He should leave. He should leave. There's no reason he should come back. He should be a champion. He could be somebody that right away, AEW, Cody Rhodes, uh, Rusev. Uh, Right away, you could see Moxley, Rusev again. You could see Moxley, uh, Omega. Just the names that you could see him with. It'd be great. It it is great. It just seems like for some guys, the WWE runs good for five, six years. You've probably plateaued. It's time for some new creative juices. Yeah, exactly. Uh, NBC announced last Saturday it ordered 11 episodes for a comedy series titled Young Rock, which will center on various stages of Dwayne The Rock Johnson's life. Uh, It basically will recount his crazy childhood into his mid-20s where he was at the University of Miami. So this should be interesting. Uh, It'll be interesting to kind of see if it gets picked up for another, I don't know, 11 episodes. I'm not really sure where you go with it. It might be a one-time deal. 
it, th- this this should be really really good. Uh, the Rock is is excited about it, so you know it's going to be good. Uh, and some sad news: The Rock's father, Rocky Johnson, died on Wednesday at seventy five. Also, this past weekend, we had the passing of WWC or WCW Luchador La Parca. He passed away at fifty six. Aha. Uh-huh. La Parca, great memories there too in terms of his character. Though his entrance Dude, was unique. His entrance was great. His freaking his costume was fantastic. <laughs> Good stuff. And then for those of you that uh, like to go down the rabbit hole of YouTube, check out the Chris Van Vliet interview with Chris Benoit's son, uh, David Christopher Benoit Jr. I think it's an unbelievable 45 minute interview. You get some real in depth knowledge, and it's a fascinating look at uh, somebody that was. Uh, part of wrestling history, and then had to deal with the tragedy, and now potentially making his way back to the ring. I just thought it was fascinating in terms of content. Uh, shared it with everybody, and it's it's worth your watch. Chris does a good interview, and uh, it's fascinating that potentially there could be another Crippler in the mix in AEW at the end of the year. Pay attention to it because some hints, uh, some interesting spoilers are maybe dropped in terms of what could happen. Nothing in the on the horizon, but maybe down the road there could be another Chris Benoit. In the ring, I'm gonna put this out there. In I don't, I don't really care. He was one of my favorite all time wrestlers. He was the intensity that he wrestled with, uh, the way he carried himself, the the overall aesthetic look of him and his move set. I thought was fantastic. I always felt like he was he was a little guy in a big dude's world, and and he did everything he could. Scratch, fight, claw. I loved it all. Um, I was absolutely devastated when. Uh, news broke on that on that very sad, tragic day, but I absolutely loved Chris Benoit. I thought he was fantastic. It's just uh, a really, really, really sad story. No doubt. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I want to thank the fine sponsor, the Flick Chat application. If you're a fan of professional wrestling and you watch Raw, you watch SmackDown, AEW, NXT, Definitely hop on to your favorite uh, app store, whether it be Google Play or the Apple Store, and download Flick Chat. And all you got to do is join Detroit Sports' newest headquarters by hitting that little plus sign, entering in these three letters, lowercase dsp, and then you're in the Flick Chat application. You're in our group. And what is Flick Chat, you ask? Well, it's a large group chat application where you can create your own forum, and it's via the phone, mobile. And what you do is you create your own topic. And if you're a fan of Detroit sports, professional wrestling, we get in the mix there and share content, botches, good spots, bad spots, angles that we like, angles that we don't like, things that uh, people that generally complain about on uh, uh, in regards to WWE, we talk about it. And it's fun because you're in control of your own topic and you can get uh, the hosts here on the network in the mix and we can have a good conversation. I always enjoy and I'm looking forward to discussing what the Royal Rumble is going to look like with you guys via Flick. Don't miss out on Detroit Sports' newest headquarters. Download Flick Chat. Thank you so much, Adam. Follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Shoot off a tweet to us anytime you want. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We'll talk soon.